We started the Eppendorf in Science Prize in 2002. It was actually presented the first time in November then that year. And in 2001, uh, we worked with our partners at Science together to found this prize. In uh, 1995, uh, we had the 50th anniversary of Eppendorf. And uh, on this uh, occasion, Dr. Netela established uh, the Young Investigator Award for European scientists. But this was only a prize uh, for the European uh, scientific community and not a global one. And so we were looking uh, what can we do in order to add a global prize. And that's uh, the reason why we partnered then uh, with the prestigious journal Science uh, in 2002 and developed the prize, uh, the Eppendorf and Science Prize for Neurobiology uh, starting in 2002. The unique thing about our prize is basically that it's not given out by nomination. Uh, it is based on the application by the applicants. So they basically take their fortune into their own hands when they apply for the prize, knowing that they compete with equally talented and, young and gifted uh, young researchers. In 2011, we are proud to announce and celebrate the 10th winner, which is the Portuguese-born scientist Dr. Tiago Branco from the University College London. My work focuses on uh, trying to understand how neurons in the brain work together to process information and how the neurons come together, how does the activity come together to generate a specific behavior. And in particular, I'm very interested in figuring out how does, what's the contribution from a single neuron? How does a single neuron work? What does it do with all the information it receives to produce a certain output? And we, what we do about it is we do experiments uh, in, in the brain of rats and we use a technique called um, two-photon glutamate and caging where we um, deliver to the neuron specific patterns of input in different sequences in different locations and ask well, how does the neuron respond to all this variety of inputs? How does that output relate to the input? And one of the main things we found recently is that neurons are very good at discriminating different sequences of input, which is something that we previously thought that only large networks of neurons can do. So this type of research tells us that neurons in the brain are very powerful in terms of the computations that they can achieve. It is a very important thing in science, uh, especially at this stage of a career when you know, I've started to apply for grants, start to apply for jobs, and I think it's, it's going to increase the visibility, and I think uh, it's definitely a very good thing. So what I've been involved in um, over the past few years is investigating uh, synaptic changes that, that unfold in um, a part of the brain known as the amygdala, uh, which processes emotional information. Um, and uh, these, these changes we, we can observe um, in animals that uh, are, are, uh, undergo auditory fear conditioning, which causes them to associate um, a cue with um, an aversive event, um, in this case a foot shock. What we were able to do uh, uh, when, when examining um, uh, currents or uh, uh, electrical currents uh, at synapses was to define a sensitive period following um, acquisition of, of memory that is associated with um, a, 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 a increased uh, lability of, of learning. Um, so a period when, um, uh, it's pos when animals um, are, are uh, prone to uh, losing memory. And uh, by applying a, a form of behavioral training during this window known as um, extinction learning, uh, we find that we can, we can permanently attenuate fear um, in animals that have acquired this memory. Um, and this is something that uh, not only is, is in, informing our understanding of, of uh, stability of memory traces, but also might lead to treatments for conditions like PTSD. Uh, uh, if, we can, if we can intervene, uh, early after a traumatic event, it might be possible to prevent the development of, of anxiety disorders. My laboratory studies the mechanisms of human neurodegenerative diseases. So these are diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and ALS, or also called Lou Gehrig's disease. 
And many of these diseases have in common that proteins form clumps in the brains of patients with the disease. And my laboratory is trying to figure out the mechanisms by which these clumps of proteins damage neurons and cause disease. The approach we're taking to tackle this is a little bit unusual in that we are using simple baker's yeast to study and model this protein misfolding problem. And um, this is research that I started when I was a postdoctoral fellow with Susan Linquist at the Whitehead Institute. And we had been studying um, the Parkinson's disease protein called alpha-synuclein and found that using yeast we were able to uncover important features of the misfolding and clumping process and what effects this has on cells. So when I started my own laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania, I began studying a protein that had just been identified as being important in the motor neuron disease, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. This protein was called TDP43, and when we put this protein into yeast, it started forming clumps and damaging yeast cells, perhaps in a similar way that it might damage neurons um, in patients with the disease. So then um, what we did was we harnessed the a power of the yeast system into in, allowing us to perform large-scale genetic screens. So asking, can we find genes that when we put them into yeast could allow the cells to grow better even though they had this toxic TDP43 um, ALS disease causing protein? And we found some of them. And um, what the essay is about is that we took one of the genes from, from that yeast screen, a yeast gene, and with a collaboration with my colleague at Penn, Dr. Nancy Bonini, we tested this genetic interaction in the fruit fly and we found that it did the same thing in flies that it did in yeast cells. Then we extended our findings to mammalian cells, to human cells. And then finally, uh, what we did was we asked, what about the relative, the homolog of that gene that we found in yeast? Could we find mutations in that in human patients? So we surveyed a large number of human patients with ALS and we actually found quite common mutations or changes in, in this gene as a genetic risk factor for ALS. So it's really opened my lab up to a whole new area of research, starting from simple yeast, going all the way up to state-of-the-art human genetics. We do it in two steps, a little bit similar to um, the selection process at Science Magazine. That means all the essays will be judged in the first round by myself and my colleagues at Science Magazine. And at that stage, we only try to find out who are the best of the whole lot. The second round then is judged by external judges. So it's usually like this that I will send the whole essay plus the CV plus what they have done it scientifically to the external judges. And then at some stage I will organize a video conference. And at the video conference, we will be together and decide. Right now, the most important thing that we can do is to provide for the future of science by supporting young scientists, by making sure that they have opportunities to do independent research and establish laboratories of their own. I've been a young scientist many decades ago myself, and uh, I know that uh, very often young scientists uh, move away from science because they feel there's not the appropriate recognition. Um, in today's world, I would add, there's also much less funding today than there used to be. So in this environment, I think it's a great way of giving them the appropriate platform and uh, also um, the kind of feedback from, their, uh, from the society around them that it's worthwhile staying in science. I think it's an important prize because it signifies the commitment, first of all, of a major company to the future of science, and secondly, it reinforces the belief that the rest of the scientific community considers young scientists so central to the present and to the future. I didn't think I have a really strong chance of winning it. I just, some colleagues suggest you apply, and I said, well, hmm, really? And then you apply, and I, yeah, I wouldn't say I thought I had a really strong chance. I certainly didn't, especially looking at the list of past winners, which is quite daunting. <laughs> if you think you have the slightest chance of, of winning, or if somebody tells you that they think that you have the slightest chance of winning, you should definitely go for it.